hello and thanks for joining us here on Encore. Coming up on today's show. Putting culture on the presidential agenda, we take a look at the place of the arts in French political life. Some seriously stunning waterworks, Versailles stages its annual choreography of fountains set to music. And we head to the plains of Mongolia for new film The Eagle Huntress, which has divided the critics. We're starting with a spot of politics here on our culture show as France looks towards its presidential elections. Arts and government might not seem like natural bedfellows, but historically, many French politicians have taken both a personal and professional interest in the cultural sector. Rebecca Rosman takes a look at how the two worlds have overlapped in the past. The intertwining of politics and culture. It officially began in 1959 when Charles de Gaulle appointed the first Minister of Cultural Affairs, André Malraux. The idea was to let France's culture shine across the world, like when Mona Lisa paid a visit to the U.S. in 1963. Why send the Mona Lisa to the United States? I'll tell you. Because no other nation would receive her like the United States. Georges Pompidou created a reputation for his love of art, here he is at a Picasso Expo in 1971. There's everyone else, and then there's Picasso. He's a giant in the arts. It's Pompidou that came up with the idea for the popular modern art museum that bears his own name. He was also known for displaying the work of young talents at the Elysee, culture at the heart of power. Everyone who has been in power in France has more or less been able to contribute to the nation's cultural expansion and make it an instrument of prestige and power. Former French President Valéry Giscard d'Estaing oversaw the creation of Musée d'Orsay. But François Mitterrand has contributed more to shaping Paris than any other president, implementing structures like the Arch at Lande Fonce, the Louvre Pyramid and the National Library. While his culture minister, Jack Lang, launched the annual Fête de la Musique Bloc Party event. But after Jacques Chirac opened the Quai Branly Civilizations Museum in 2006, expanding the arts has become less of a priority for politicians. For an artist like Abdel Malik, that's something that needs to change. A good president should be interested in all kinds of culture, everyday culture, in a way that goes beyond the basic national requirements. He may or may not find that change on May 7th. We're staying in France and going to one of the most visited heritage sites in the country, the Palace of Versailles. Attracting millions of tourists every year, the gardens are an example of the French formal style designed by master landscaper Le Nôtre. And if you make it to Versailles during the summer months, there's an extra attraction. The garden's fountains come alive to the sound of music in a choreographed show that harks back to the time of Louis XIV. Pierre Delrieux has more. It's a 350 years old tradition dating back to King Louis XIV, and it's intrinsically linked to the Palace of Versailles. The musical fountain show was originally commissioned by the Sun King himself to entertain his court. To this day, the ballet of waterworks and music attracts and delights visitors. It's gorgeous. We can't get enough of it. Splendid. Beautiful. Amazing. For me, being able to see this kind of spectacle, it's just nice. It's, it gives me, like, joy. <laughs> A magical spectacle that begins underground. Buried under the palace's gardens, kilometers of pipes feed water to the hundreds of fountains around the park. Most of the insulation dates back to the mid-1600s. These pipes we originally built very thick, which explains why they've held all these years. There is some corrosion, but it's thick enough and still watertight. The corrosion itself has also locked the metal pipes together. And it's been holding for 350 years, which is amazing. Metal pipes made today last at most 80 years. 
Millions of liters of water pumped from the river Seine go through a series of reservoirs before being pushed up to the fountains, a technological prowess for the time proudly claimed by the king's engineers who signed their work with a fleur-de-lis, the royal symbol. Nowadays, some of the park's fountains are set on automatic timers, but most of them still need to be opened manually. It takes a bit of effort. You need to put your back into it. But the reward is well worth the effort. And as the water flows, different parts of the park come alive. Some intimate, like the recently restored Golden Children's Fountain, and others more majestic, like Apollo's Fountain. A feast for the eyes and ears of Versailles' 10,000 daily visitors, which can be enjoyed all through the summer. We're moving to fashion now and taking a look at a designer who's built a career from a very unlikely start in life. Sami Nouri arrived alone in France seven years ago as a young migrant. Since then, he's trained in dressmaking and is about to launch his own collection. Shirley Sipon has the story. Tours train station and a nearby park. That's where Sami Nouri was left seven years ago at the age of 13. He arrived in France alone with a migrant smuggler who had promised his parents to take care of him. That didn't happen. I didn't even know whether this was France or not. I looked around and tried to communicate with people, but I couldn't talk to anyone because I did not speak the language nor English. After spending a night on the street, Sami headed to the closest police station. Authorities sent him to a youth shelter. He was later placed with a foster family. The teenager studied fashion design, a passion passed on to him by his father, who was a seamster back in Afghanistan. Asya recruited Nuri as an intern. I gave him a trouser bottom and he started sewing as if he'd done this all his life. He was quicker than I was. Not really surprising. Nori used to sew 200 dresses per week in his father's old workshop. The young designer has never slowed down. He's worked with renowned professionals, Jean-Paul Gaultier, John Galliano. He recently opened his own studio in Paris. I've worked on important pieces. I helped make a dress for Kylie Minogue. I worked for heads of state. The designer now works on his first own collection, which he could present in a castle in a matter of days. Nouri's plans seem like a dream come true for an Afghan migrant. But the young man believes that hard work can help accomplish almost anything. It's not that difficult to make it in life, even for a foreigner. France treats us well and gives us opportunities to succeed. In exchange, why not try the hardest we can? Nouri's story is heartwarming for many, who may be pleased with the next chapter. That's when the young Afghan officially becomes French in a few days. Next, a film that's been billed as a heartwarming documentary, telling the story of a Kazakh girl who hunts on horseback with her golden eagle. But some critics have accused the film of being nothing more than a crudely staged homily on female empowerment, suggesting some scenes are not authentic. It seems that the girl power narrative in The Eagle Huntress is more complicated than its director might have us believe. Haxi Myers-Belkin reports. She's 13 years old. She's strong. She's brave. And she's a total natural. The Eagle Huntress is a documentary that tells the story of a young Kazakh nomad girl. With her father's encouragement, Aishal Pan defies social norms to become an eagle hunting master, working alongside her very own golden eagle to catch foxes and wolves during the Mongolian winter. It's a practice reserved, we're told, for men. I knew that traditional eagle hunting was for men. I didn't know any female eagle hunters, but I thought that could change. Aishal Pan. Older men from her community disapprove, but that doesn't stop Aishal Pan training for a prestigious eagle hunting competition. 
She was really turning tradition on its head. She was the first girl to take part in that competition, the first girl in centuries of the practice. But a number of critics have questioned the film's claims to authenticity, with many convinced that certain scenes were staged. Also under fire, the film's insistence on the groundbreaking feminism of Aishulpan's achievement. One American historian has said the film simply ignores the existence of other Kazakh eagle huntresses and willfully exaggerates the patriarchal pressures placed on our heroine. One Australian paper goes so far as to accuse the film of being a fantasy for Western eyes, constructed from Western prejudice about primitive peoples. Director Otto Bell denies it all, insisting that everything we see in his film is authentic. So is the eagle huntress an uplifting tale of female empowerment or a misleading and orientalist fiction? The truth may lie somewhere in between. We're finishing with an exhibition open... Oh, sorry, I've lost it now. We're finishing with an exhibition opening at the Arab World Institute here in Paris. The show's called The Islamic Treasures of Africa, and it shines a light on the rich cultural footprints left by the religion across the continent, from Dakar to Zanzibar. From 8th century amulets to the cutting edge of contemporary production, it's a new perspective on sub-Saharan art. Remember to check out our website, and you can also keep up with us on Twitter and Facebook. There's more news coming up on France 24 after this. <laughs>